you explain what the word dope means? Dope. 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 So welcome to The Dope Show. I am your host, Kiana Hughes. Uh, today's episode, we are speaking with Dr. Troy, Rant- Troy Alexander L. of Higher Level Healthcare. Dr. Troy is a, certi- is a certifying, um, well, she's a medical doctor, but she certifies patients for the Illinois Medical Cannabis Program through her practice, and she's actually transitioned her practice to be able to do that. And so I just wanted to have a discussion with you today. You know, welcome, Dr. Troy. Thank you for your time today. Are you on mute or are you good? Thank you. Thank you for having me. No, I'm good. It was frozen. Sorry. Oh, okay. Yeah, let me know if that freezes on my side or on your side. Um, yeah. So I don't want to spend a whole lot of time with me telling people who you are. Why don't you just give us an introduction to uh, Dr. Troy and to higher level healthcare, and then we could just ease the conversation from there. Sure. So I am Dr. Troy. Um, I'm originally from Baltimore, Maryland, and came to Chicago um, 2012 for residency. So I did my residency at both Cook County and Rush Hospitals. So um, I had some pretty good training um learned a lot and my focus was um primary care so i wanted to be a primary care doctor um go in the community help people that look like me that were came from underserved um environments not a lot of access to things and that's what i did i started working in a primary care office i was there for about um three years and i was miserable and um it just wasn't what i expected i wasn't helping people in the way that i thought i could um access was still being denied despite us being with one of the biggest healthcare systems in the chicagoland area um and i just felt like there was a there had to be something more and so um i i was very depressed at the time um i didn't know i was until i started seeing a therapist and she said girl <laughs> you're depressed <Yeah. laughs> and, well sometimes it's and, like that we can get we can be real functional in our dysfunction and just yeah you know he's just like this is how i am it's right just now. how it is how you are and i thought i just thought like me being like mean or like just in a bad mood was just like that was just part of being an adult like you just hmm. you have problems you got bills having a like not great days was just a part of it um and so it was around, it was all at this, everything was sort of happening at the same time where I was introduced to cannabis. There were people who were asking me about patients who were asking me to help get them certified for medical cannabis. Um, and I wasn't comfortable with it because um, as many people know, in the last like five to 10 years, opioids um, became very big. And a part of it was because of the nonchalant prescribing that doctors were doing and people became addicted and um, things started spiraling from there. So in my mind, when the medical cannabis pilot program began in Illinois, I felt like I am not about to be a part of another opioid crisis. Like I'm not going to be in the forefront of that. So you kind of equated the two or you kind of saw one being an indicator of what's going to happen with the other. Yeah, I was very um, skeptical until I started doing more research and following more pages and just like reading books about cannabis and how it has helped people, especially people with depression and anxiety. Um, And then I stopped working there. And like, it was just like floodgates opened up. I was hearing about cannabis all the time. Um, I was getting introduced to more and more people. And then um, That was in 2018 and at the end of 2018 i decided to start higher level healthcare to help patients get certified because i wanted to well part of the reason was i wanted to try to get certified for medical cannabis but couldn't find a a physician who was number one reasonably priced 
Um, mm -hmm. And number two, there are a lot of, I felt like people were taking advantage of patients um, in the sense, mm, maybe I won't say that. Well, no, I believe that. <laughs> there were definitely were, some people who were taking advantage of patients. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think that is fair to say. Not everybody, but ma'am, we both know. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> there are people who were taking advantage. And then, like, um, a, being a, the, I felt like some of the, being, I felt like being a primary care physician and having a broader scope, not just focused on pain or um, other specialties because internal medicine is like the adult medicine doctor that I felt like I would be very qualified to, the more I learned about cannabis, I'll be able to help with a wider array of conditions and be able to really explain um, things in a different way than some other special specialists would. So, um, that's why I decided to start, and then I got the blessing from my family after I talked to them about it, um, which was a big deal for me. Um, was it a so, big yeah, deal for them? Actually, initially, my mom was nervous um, because a lot of people, they just think that you're going to be selling cannabis. They don't realize, like, no, I'm helping people who've already made even an adult prescription. Yeah, like, right. There's no prescription. prescription. People yeah. who are looking to who have made adults who have made a decision to consume cannabis for medical reason i'm verifying that they have that condition and also um i don't want to jump ahead but also helping them through that process um and so the hardest sell in my mind was going to be to my mom but she eventually like she's started seeing more and understanding more and asking questions um, and when your eyes are open to something then you start to see it um, I think that's just how the universe works. Um, and it was Thanksgiving of 2018. Our family like went on a family trip. And um, some people were consuming. <laughs> and I was like, you know what? This is the time for me to come out and just say what I'm doing and what I want to do. And they're like, yeah, yeah whatever. <laughs> like, you see me in here. We Wait, so, right. So your family. So they were already consumers. So... If they were okay with that, then, you know, certainly, like, yeah, okay, whatever. Yeah, right. but, but it had just, come, like, in the months prior, that's when I found out that people in my family consumed. Like, before that, it was, like, it was only, like, my stoner cousins oh, who, like, gotcha. that wasn't Troy, who's, like, a doctor, who's this, oh, who's on the straight okay. and narrow. You were so the good it was, one, yeah. Yes. Troy, and the so, golden child. <laughs> yes, very much, very much so. Yep. And that's a, yep. that's difficult when um, you're trying to do something against the uh, against the grain. Um, so it was nice to really have their support. And my cousins were like, "Yes, finally!" <laughs> right now you so, now yeah. you cool, right? Now, mm -hmm. <laughs> like, okay, you ain't a lame after all. <laughs> yeah, let's go take a walk. <laughs> yeah, right, I'm right. Yeah, us for the walk now. Take yeah. that you're invited. That's I got invited. <laughs> right now, you get to go to the store, right? Mm -hmm, <laughs> mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah, it was, yeah, that's funny. Doctor or provider side is that, like we alluded to earlier, is that you have to give a prescription, which is not the case. Is that you are verifying that a patient has these conditions and they're coming to you for that and that alone it's not your right to say whether or not they can they're allowed to use it or um right. that's that's not your job your job is to verify that they have the condition and to um allow them to move forward in taking control of their health care and um so i think that is a misconception that people have it's like you're not prescribing anything you're not it's not illegal. You're simply just like you would if a person came in and needed a, any other form, um, like a FMLA form. You just have to say, like, you know, they got hurt. This is what happened. And now I'm signing off on it. You're not saying that you was there and saw them slip and fall. It's none of that. It's verification. Um, and for the patient side, I think is that you can't be functional or be productive and be a medical cannabis patient or a cannabis consumer. 
um, because the two can go hand in hand. And that's where um, I think having a doctor like myself who is is invested in cannabis or I guess that's the right word, invested in energy into learning about the plant and how it helps people and the best ways to sort of consume and be productive because a lot of times the and what I often tell patients is the conditions that you're being qualified for, they don't go away because you're on the clock. If you have chronic pain and you sit at a desk, your pain is likely going to be worse when you're sitting at a desk for eight hours. And if you have to wait until 5 p.m. or 6 p.m. when you get home to consume in any form or fashion, then that is not, you're not living in your best potential. And so um, really being able to help change that um, that thought process for patients is one of, um, I think, a, a super big misconception. Because mm -hmm. people would take opioids during the day. Like, you don't think twice. If you're in pain, you'll pop a Norco, you'll take a... Sorry, my dog came there. Come on. Okay. Let's see. Oh. Okay, mm -hmm. he, she. I'm a dog mom. He, Charlie. Charlie. Hi, Charlie. Charlie, right, handsome. So the, one of the, I guess, differences in Illinois is that you don't have to register. So you don't have to be technically, well, okay. For the medical cannabis, like, pilot program, which is no longer a pilot, um, right. you don't have to register or be on any sort of registry to serve patients, which is, um, whether or not that's good or bad, that's a different conversation. Um, but you don't have to necessarily do anything. You need to have a DEA number. You have to have a, um, a Illinois license to practice. Um, but otherwise, you don't need to do anything specific. To register patients for the opioid program, um, you do have to register online and create a profile and things of that nature but to just see patients to get them started with their medical card um, technically anyone who has a Illinois like prescriber's license can do it um, but you want to be knowledgeable and that's where the the extra legwork comes into play of being knowledgeable doing your own research getting um, education from companies like your company, Elevated Education, and really being, when I said invest in your time and energy and, um, and your love and passion for the plant and for the plant as medicine comes into play because people can tell um, the difference when you're um, really into it. Uh -huh. And not just here for the for it. Uh, that was one of the reasons why I um, started the company as well was for accessibility and access to care. Um, like I said, that's one of my that was like one of my core values going into medicine to begin with. So um, being able to what I felt like was have a a platform or a yeah platform where people could come um, and not feel like they had to break the bank or that the amount of energy that I was giving um, wasn't worth what they received. And so I felt like the way I sort of started my business was very much um, cognizant of that to be able to be accessible to, to everyone. Some healthcare systems, number one, they at flat out tell, well, they flat out tell the per prescribers or, sorry, I keep saying prescribers, the healthcare professionals um, that they cannot do anything when it's, as it's related to cannabis. Um, other companies will say like, oh, you need to have this and we're going to create our own, um, our own like teaching what a, I don't know, I heard this somewhere. Like continuing um, education or. Mm -hmm. um, and then after yeah. we do that, then you'll be able to um, help people or do this, or we're going to figure out how to do it on our, basically, 
I personally think they want to figure out how to do it on their own terms and really yeah. be able to capitalize off of that. And that's part of the reason why um, they really haven't subscribed to allowing the provider because they haven't figured out a way to make money off of it yet. Mm -hmm. um, but that. Uh, I look at it as a three step process. Um, the first, obviously, is determining that you want to get cannabis as a, like, medical cannabis, um, and then going on and finding a provider um, who is willing to um, certify you. Ideally, that would be your primary care physician um, or even a pain management doctor. Anyone that you see for that specific condition should be initially the, the person, ideally the person who's certifying you. If a patient was to run into, um, which a lot of people do, the situation that we just talked about where their um, provider is not willing to certify them, then you would go like find someone like me, myself. Um, several dispensaries um, offer lists of providers that they are affiliated with. And so I would say that's a good place to start to figure out who's going to um, who's going to do your certification. Looking at the website and sort of um, seeing what type of information is on there, um, I think is important. I think looking at the price points is important, um, and if you also like asking questions. Um, even though I still have like a, a nine to five job, um, I think people that are uncertain when they send me an email or they click like the contact me button, um, they, it's, it's a, it puts a, a real person behind, behind the website. And so having that interaction and just seeing how, how they answer your question and, things like that, um, just like you were willingness and ability, like willingness and ability yeah. to actually speak and have an interaction. Yes. And some people, if they have like a physical space, you know, have bills, um, that would be one reason. Um, another reason may be the team that they have. Um, so if it's like some, like a larger company that has to outsource, so they have to like pay for the platform, they have to pay for, um, the providers, uh, things like that. So it's, you don't get all the money is like divided up. So in order to make, make it worth like the healthcare provider wow. while, then they charge more because it has to be divvied up. Um, so, and then for myself, um, I'm, it was a it was definitely a struggle for me um to charge my price and initially like i just felt like oh this is not worth like am i worth somebody spending that amount of money to for me, for me to certify them and then what i had to realize is the amount of information that i'm getting um they're probably not getting from anywhere else and the amount of energy that i'm expending like my energy is valuable, my time is valuable. And so I think um, really being able to go through that personally and know that like when, I'm when I get timid and I'm like, oh, it's cost this amount, people are like, okay. Like the amount of information that you gave me, like I will pay that again. And I'm like, okay. The, because they want you to have that relationship so that in turn turned into people coming multiple times and then once they figured out that you can charge for each time they come because technically if we were billing for insurance each time you come into the office you get billed um so it's sort of in the fact that it's a cash business um then that made it more lucrative and then the fact that depending on the neighborhood and the socioeconomic status of the people that you're around, um, you can charge what you charge because they're, they're going to pay it. So it's, it's a couple different things um, that, that factor in. I think those are, yeah. 
is there any part of it that is ever covered by insurance or are there any doctors who you know you know you can get um i think there are some companies that use insurance um like i said if you go through your primary or like a doctor that you already see um at the visit because you're seeing them and they if they um complete the the document at that time then that would be covered under your insurance um but like personally insurance is just when you're starting a business um insurance doesn't pay yeah I've heard they that. take a long time um to get reimbursement And so, and it's a whole, it's like a, that's like a a job in and of itself and being a small business and like a solo practitioner, um, it just, to me, it wasn't worth, um, worth it at that time. So, um, then you need somebody to like chase down the insurance statements, you need a medical biller or whatever. A bill, exactly. You need a biller, you need to be registered with all of the insurance companies that takes like months like six months um so it's so it's something that's easy to get off the ground as a cash business Um, so for myself the total visit is two hundred dollars uh so i have on my website you can register um schedule your consultation visit um and it's a $50 deposit at that time that goes toward the total payment. Um, and part of the reason why I do a deposit is because, like I said before, my time is valuable, your time is valuable. And so working in healthcare, you know, people make appointments, they don't show up, and then that's a space loss. So um, it kind of ensures both of us that we are committed to this process. Um, then we have the consult. Then we have the consultation visit, which is about thirty minutes, depending how many questions um, a person has. But usually, about thirty minutes is the average. And um, we discuss a lot of things, um, different methods of consumption. We talk about like the the qualifying condition. Some patients come to me knowing what the condition is; others are not sure if they have one. And like I said earlier, being an internal medicine doctor, I'm very comfortable with diagnosing someone. So if you tell me your symptoms, then I can then say, okay, that's what this is. Um, I did have to, some of the diagnoses that are on the, um, on the list are so rare. And um, I was yeah. like, I had to do research. I was like, I haven't read this since medical school. Let me get a book <laughs> and figure out what this you know what? is. I, whenever I'm giving a class, I always say, like, look, I I put the list up, right? And I'm like, I don't, even, I don't know what this stuff is. Like, I highlight the ones that we know what they are. And I always say, well, but I, I, I leave those other ones up there and on the list because it's a blessing that I don't know what it is. But somebody exactly. in my audience knows exactly what that is. And they're like, yo, my, my abstinence, brain stress, you know, whatever. My... <laughs> Myasthenia gravis. Like, Girl, they're like, oh, my myasthenia gravis has been acting up all week. And you're like, oh, well, look, there's, there there's relief for you. So. Mm-hmm. A lot of people will, in the email or like the contact, they'll say, oh, I have back pain or I have like this pain in my foot for the last few years after surgery, do I qualify? And I'm like, yes, that's chronic pain chronic pain um, after, I guess that was August 2019, became a qualifying condition, which was huge for the state. Um, A lot of PTSD, um, a lot of people suffer from depression and anxiety. And one of the things that, and depression and anxiety are not themselves qualifiers. And so what I think I did early on, um, which sort of set me apart is I did not say PTSD. Most people don't know that they have PTSD they know. Right, right. because they haven't been diagnosed. But depression and anxiety, um, usually if they appear together, nine times out of 10, you have PTSD. Something is triggering those things to happen. It doesn't have to look like a war movie when fireworks go off and you crawl under the bed. Right. That's not um, typical PTSD. So, And then that also came with my research, and it leads back to being invested in 
the information and knowing what is what that allowed me to really be able to say that to people confidently. Um, so PTSD, chronic pain, um, IBS after that was added in August was has been really big. Um, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis got added, um, which was huge because I have ulcerative colitis. Um, so that was a, a win. Um, what else? That more and more diabetics are coming. Um, so they have a lot of chronic pain, neuropathy, which is that numbness, tingling right. in their hands and feet. Um, I would say those are the main things. I've had a few anorexia patients, which was, um, I thought that was good that they're looking um, to cannabis to help with that. Anorexia appetite. is on the list or is, mm -hmm. is that the wasting? Okay. No, anorexia nervosa is like the fifth one down. Okay. In the first column. Um, being black in America um, is PTSD personified, um, yeah. especially with what's going on with uh, the young man that was killed in February. And I mean, and even since then, like somebody else got killed this week on Facebook Live and just like, yeah. all that trauma but we have to see on television a person being murdered and it's just yeah. looked at as another news story and not um our lives are not valued and so that in of itself is very triggering for a lot of people and even with this uh you know girl with this coronavirus thing coronavirus. This, you know social distancing and self-quarantine mm -hmm. and you know we like how crazy is it that we go from you know i know you don't have kids but you know telling your kids you know don't wear your hoods and make sure people can see mm -hmm. you and make sure you're and now everybody's gotta walk around with a mask with a mask with a mask on so now i'm i'm sending my you know my black men into these stores with masks on and then yeah. you have you know all kinds of crazy stuff happening and so the things are just kind of at a fever pitch i think a lot more people could get um yes can be certified for PTSD just right now, you know what I'm saying? Yes. Just based on what's happening right now, you know? Mm -hmm. It's brought up definitely a lot of um, past trauma for people. And then another thing that came up that I didn't um, initially think about, and that not, I don't know how often it's talked about, is for people who are abused um, and happen to be quarantined with someone who mm -hmm. and that's a yeah. huge huge one and so um i thought that that was interesting that that isn't really talked about a whole lot but it's definitely a reason it's, or if someone has left an abusive situation and now they're stuck in the house and just thinking about um all people who are in their same situ who are in their former yeah. situation that can't get out yeah. And that can be triggering. And not to mention the kids. You know, I have had this conversation even with my own children. Like, guys, this is, yeah, it sucks, but, you know, we're blessed. There's a lot of people. Blessed. There are some of your classmates, some of the people, some of the kids at your school, they don't eat if they don't go to school. Or their, mm -hmm. you know, their home life is just shitty. And their parents are yep. beating them probably even more now, you know? Yep. Or they just, their school is their escape, right? Yes. So, in response to people not being able to get uh, certified by their doctor. Um, now, nurse practitioners, who else? Chiropractors? Chiropractors? I don't know. I, know, uh, I don't know about chiropractors, but okay. I know. I know nurse practitioners. It, was, it, it used to be just MDs and DOs. And DOs, uh huh. Right. Now, I think it's nurse practitioners and PAs, right, physician assistants. Uh-huh. Okay. No, I, might, I don't know practice. about the chiropractors. No, okay. take them out. I misspoke. Okay, yeah. I wasn't <laughs> sure if it was PAs or not. I, I couldn't remember yeah. if a PA could do it or not. Um, so, yeah, so yeah. they opened it up because, in, especially, like, in a lot of urgent cares or just even in offices nowadays, doctors, um, in the traditional sense, are not the ones who are oftentimes taking care of the patients. It's really um, what we call mid-level um, healthcare professionals, so PAs and nurse practitioners, who are 
really have become the healthcare primary healthcare provider. And so um, somebody has some good lobbyists um, to be able to get them, which is fair uh, because yeah. they do a lot, a lot um, for the patients to really be able to sign off on those forms without the red tape that the doctors have to go through or think that they have to go through in order to be able to and to to certify someone and and traditionally um i think nurse practitioners are and pas are seen as like a little bit more open to things and not as um uptight as say a doctor would be so um i know there are definitely some people who have started making businesses um and a lot of people who, who want to make a business um, by seeing patients and helping people get certified for medical cannabis, but just don't know what to do. And so that's really what our um, talk is gonna be about in this class, really giving you some tools and some tips and just saying, and sometimes you just gotta jump out on faith and if you believe it, then they will too. Absolutely. Um and so we're going to do a little bit of like real introductory basic <clears throat> cannabis 101 level uh, type of information. And then, um, you know, I'm going to get out the way and, and let Dr. Troy just do her thing. Um, she's going to share some best practices, some things that she has learned along mm -hmm. the way um, in the, you know, in her own practice and her own experiences. And so really just to kind of demystify it for those who are interested and for people who are, you know, I have people reach out to me all the time. There are a lot of people who are starting to develop a passion for cannabis or who are really curious about how do I get involved in this, you know, and they don't know where to start or they feel like mm -hmm. they're supposed to have like doctor level, you know, medical school level yeah. information and research to start. And that's just not true. And I think a lot of doctors are, are not at that level. You know? Yeah, we're learning. Um, there's so much to learn about the plant. And I think that was a big thing for me is um, you do all this schooling to feel like an expert at something. And then here comes cannabis where majority of people are not experts because they haven't been allowed to be. It was illegal for you to try to figure this stuff out. And so knowing that you're in an evolving um, practice is kind of cool to or evolving field rather is really cool. So it, it, it takes away some of that. Um, pressure to know everything and it's okay most patients are fine with you saying like you know what I'm not sure um, but I can find out and that's always been something that has been a part of me I don't fake the funk I will never and so being <laughs> able to say like you know I don't know but let's figure it out together <laughs> and people I think um, people who come to me um, appreciate honesty and if you don't then you got the wrong one good now, whereas before it was exclusively forbidden in the law to yes. certify patients via telemedicine, now it is exclusively um, allowed. <laughs> yes, and that has been awesome for a lot of people to be able to um, get certified virtually. Uh, so that has been a gr great for myself. Um, being able to work at home and like you said being blessed to be able to continue my business and continue to um, manage and thrive in what's going on in the outside world um, so if you have loved ones or people who um, are bed bound homebound dementia all those things that can't necessarily easily get out to a to an office um, now is really the time to have them get certified because it's, it's legal to do um, over telemedicine. And it's very simple, just click and make your appointment. Dr. Shore, can you just uh, wrap it up and tell people where they can um, find you if they wanna reach out to you, if they wanna know about know more about higher level or if they got questions or if they wanna send you a picture of a ward on their back and see what you think about that. But. <laughs> um. And you know that water in the back could be one of those qualifying conditions because there is one on there, neurofibromatosis. Like, ah, can you look at my, I think I got something right here. I think that's on the list. Yeah, it, it, one of them is. Um, but I can, my website is, well, my company is called Higher Level Healthcare. 
Um, so higher level HC is our website, higher level HC.com. And then, um, to get in touch with me, you can go either through the website. There's a contact that comes contact like box that goes, comes directly to my email. I feel like that's the easiest way. Um, and also on the website, it has the, um, my, what my, what's it called? Email, um, which is info at higher level hc.com. But I feel like the best way is through the website. And also I'm on Instagram. Come check me out at uh, TroyAlexisMD.com. I sometimes give uh, some good information on there and just talk about how to get certified and um, some sort of best practices, tips for patients. Good, and that is exactly the stuff that we are gonna be talking about um, in our class. Um, the class is, what's the name of it? Illinois Medical Cannabis Patient um, certification class. You can find out more information about it at www.elevatededucationllc.com. Um, you can follow Elevated Education at Elevated Education LLC on Instagram and on Facebook. Dr. Choi, this was awesome. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank, Thank you, you so for much. having me. And I look forward to more conversations because I want to break down stuff like women's health and then like seniors and, you know, mm -hmm. cannabis just touches on so many different things that I would just love to just nerd out and just, you know, talk to you about yeah, some of definitely. That, like, nerdy stuff. Yeah, I'm excited to be a nerd with someone. <laughs> and Charlie <laughs> may join us, you know, he's a... Uh, love Charlie. And yo, cannabis for pets. It's all, there's all kinds of things. Oh my God. So... Yep, All right. Thank some you, Dr. Troy. Enjoy you. your um, the rest of your day, and you I'll too. talk to you later. I'll see you next week. Okay. All right. Bye bye. Bye.